thank you so much for inviting me to address your meeting. I'm going to talk to you about the autism revolution, and I sorely wish I could be there to talk to you in person, but I really wasn't able to make the long trip. I've recently finished a book and published a book called The Autism Revolution, Whole Body Strategies for Making Life All It Can Be. That book was written with a professional science writer for the general public. What I'm going to be presenting to you now is the science in more detail that underlies that book. And in particular, I'm going to be talking to you about chronic, persistent, and changeable features that affect the whole person, the whole body, the whole system. You may know that autism is behaviorally defined. Biology is not part of the definition, and neither is prognosis. Nothing in the definition says once you're autistic, you're that way your whole life. It, it involves, at the present time, through, in the present definition, three criteria, social interaction, social communication, and restricted behavior or interest uh, characteristics, and all kinds of other things that so many people with autism experience, the seizures, the cognitive deficits, the sensory motor abnormalities, the savant skills, immune problems, GI, or food issues, are not part of the definition because they're not common to everyone, although the sensory features look like they're going to be part of the new, the forthcoming DSM-5 definition. There is no biological test for identifying autism at this time. But we do know it's biological because there's so much biological evidence. But the biology is not necessarily consistent from one person to another. And we don't know what the underlying commonalities are yet, although some of us have theories. When I came into the field 17 years ago, we were told that autism was caused by genes that affected the brain, and that there would be specific genes for each of the, and specific brain regions for each of the deficits, and that there would only be three to 10 genes. Well, it's come out very different than that. We haven't had a modular framework where there are little pieces, like a Lego piece, uh, for each of the uh, defined behaviors. It's become something much more complicated. And instead, what we're coming to is a new model, which I'm calling an autism revolution. That's why I called my book that. We're moving from the idea that we have a genetic brain impairment, a lifelong broken brain, to an environmental medical obstruction of brain function that's still under there, that's still in there. I'm saying that it's not just genetic because we found hundreds of genes, mostly with modest impact. The numbers of people with autism going up, and there's growing evidence for big impacts from environmental factors. It's not just brain because there are whole body systemic features. And the physiology that is involved is environmentally vulnerable and affects both body and brain. It's not just brain modules because the whole brain is involved and there's brain tissue changes. And it's not necessarily hardwired because there's plasticity and recovery. And so let me say again, is autism really a hardwired deficit, or is it more about the software? Research and clinical observation suggest that it's not hardwired. We see kids getting better during fever and staying better for a few weeks, being much more interactive, better eye contact. Um, there's documented recovery and remission in some cases, and reversal of symptoms in autism-relevant gene models. How can the brain improve like this, and what is it telling us about autism? Many of us are developing a hypothesis that autism is not a static encephalopathy, but a dynamic encephalopathy, not a, a, of something wrong with the brain that is fixed for life, but something uh, going on with the brain that's changeable and not necessarily permanent. This slide is difficult for us to animate right now, so I'm going to walk you through it and make believe you're only seeing the parts where my pointer goes. We're told that autism is genetic. But we're also learning that the physical and the psychosocial environment play a role. The combination of all of these factors impact the way cells function and lead to cellular dysfunction, problems with the cells energy production, signaling, and metabolism don't work so well. This impacts the brain. 
and it impacts the body, too. The brain issues lead to communication, social interaction, and restricted behaviors that comprise autism, that are used to define autism. But the brain issues also lead to sensory issues, sleep problems, and seizures. Both body and brain are involved in the sensory sleep and seizure issues. And the body issues also include gastrointestinal GI issues, digestive issues, immune issues, hormonal problems, and more. The combination of all of these problems leads to someone who's frustrated, more easily overwhelmed, and he experiences more pain, poor function, and sickness. This leads to overload and stress. And that overload and stress feeds back up and makes the cellular dysfunction worse. So if you're sleep deprived, that makes you stressed out. And when you're stressed out, your immune system and your cells work worse. And it just becomes a vicious circle that goes round and round. So this is very important because it means that it's not just what we th thought it was 10 or 15 years ago. I want to focus now on the assumption that autism is a developmental disorder. This seems obvious because it occurs during development, but the assumption carries a lot of baggage. What is this baggage? People think that if autism is a developmental disorder, it's all genetic and predetermined. The damage is done really early before you're born. The brain is fundamentally and irretrievably differently structured and broken. Brain changes are the cause of all the problems, and there's nothing can, you can do about it. Well, let's examine the evidence. Are these implications consistent with the facts? And you may guess from the way I'm setting this up that I don't think they are. So first of all, let's walk through this step by step and start with the genetic. People thought it was genetic and predetermined, but now we know genes interact with environment. There's epigenetics, which is about gene expression. And genes and physiology and environment interact together. I'm going to talk to you about whether the numbers are going up and how these gene, environment, and epigenetic factors interact. I want to bring to your attention a new book called Genetic Explanations, Sense and Nonsense, edited by Sheldon Krimsky and Jeremy Gruber from Harvard University Press that's just out. In fact, I may not even be totally out yet because I just went to Amazon. And it said pre-order, but it should be available very soon. And I wrote chapter 10 on autism, from static genetic brain defect to dynamic gene environment and modulated pathophysiology. And you can get this book, and, and there are a lot of other good articles in there too, helping people to not overuse genetics to explain biology, which is much bigger than genetics. Let's look at the environmental role in autism. The numbers of cases in California went up 1,200%, 12-fold, between 1987 and 2007. But mental retardation, epilepsy, and cerebral palsy did not. Uh, a number of scholars have looked at this data. And it looks like you can explain away a lot of this increase through factors like calling people autistic who previously would have been called something else, social influences, older parents and clusters geographically. But there's a large proportion in this graph, 44%, in a study by Overhertz Picciotto that was 65%, that can't be explained and might well be new environmental contributors. And not only is there a growing body of associations of environmental exposures with autism risk and prevalence, as I already said, but a recent largest twin study to date concluded that susceptibility to autism in their large data set showed moderate genetic heritability, but a substantial shared twin environmental component. Here's an intriguing question about concordance. Concordance means that if one twin has, has a diagnosis, the other one has it too. In Sweden, they did a study of twins with uh, identical twins, at least one of whom had schizophrenia. They divided the group into two groups, probably the same placenta and different placentas. Everybody in the twin pairs had the same genes. Each, tw each in the two twins had the same genes. If they shared the same placenta, 
during pregnancy, they had 60% concordance 60, if 60% 60 of the second twin had schizophrenia if the first one did. And if, but if they had different placentas, only 11% of the second twins had, had schizophrenia. This hasn't been done with autism, but the very idea that identical twins could have different outcomes depending on placentas suggests that environment plays an important role. Environment is not a constant. constant. We are facing an unprecedented production of new-to-nature substances. And if you look at this graph, you see an increase in synthetic chemicals, especially going up after the end of World War II, when the conversion of wartime chemical weaponry factories and other things into pesticide and household chemical factories um, contributed to an, to an enormous increase in chemicals that human beings and organisms on Earth had never seen before. A study done just a few years ago by a nonprofit group looked in baby's cord blood from birth to see how many of 454 chemicals they could detect. And they detected 287 of those chemicals, not necessarily in large amounts, but 180 of those chemicals can cause cancer. 217 can be toxic to the brain and nervous system. 208 cause birth defects or abnormal development in animal tests. And nearly 200 have been banned from the market in the US for years. These kinds of chemicals can affect epigenetics or gene expression, even if they're in low doses. All of this should be understood to be in the context of the instability of our planet. In 2006, the United Nations issued a report called The State of the Planet. And they pointed out that in their executive summary, ecosystem damage is so severe that we can no longer be confident that planet Earth can support human life for more than two generations. And I personally see the increases in autism in this broader context. In the United States, Wendell Berry, an environmental philosopher, said, our national faith has always been there's always more. Our true religion is a sort of autistic industrialism. And the article was accompanied, accompanied by this picture of, 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 of garbage cars, junkyard cars crushed and piled up, just as a, an autistic child might line up cars in, in neat little rows. So what I'm saying is that one way of looking at the autism spectrum is that it's the tip of the iceberg and the canary in the coal mine. So autism rates are going up, but a lot of other people are getting sick too. That's the tip of the iceberg. The canary in the coal mine is the canary who's in the mine with the miners. And when the canary keels over from invisible fumes, the miners know they need to leave. Uh, I discuss these concepts very much in my website autismwhyandhow.org, W-H-Y-A-N-D-H-O-W. And I'll have a slide on this website later. And there's an article that just came out called, Should Autism Be Considered a Canary Bird Telling Us That Homo Sapiens May we Be on Its Way to the Extinction? This article is free online, and I've included the links. It's a very interesting article by, by an evolutionary biologist, a nutritional biochemist, looking at the way environment can impact the ovaries and the testes and create vulnerability and how the mutation rate may be going up. I want to talk about glutathione. Glutathione is a chemical that everybody should know about, but most of us don't. It protects cells from environmental stress, but it's often low in autism and an enormous number of other chronic conditions. It's made in the liver from three amino acids, glutamate, cysteine, and glycine. It's vital for detoxification. It mops up toxins and free radicals. And it's the body's most potent antioxidant. And it's the most abundant antioxidant in the brain. It's a final common pathway because it's depleted by thousands of toxins by oxidative stress, infection, inflammation, and a nutrient-poor diet. So there are so many different ways that glutathione can go down that even small exposures can add up to large problems in health because of the cumulative impact uh, on depleting glutathione. 
Here is a little bit of data on low glutathione. And on the left is a graph with autism where you see that glutathione is higher in controls than in autism. And this was from blood samples. On the right, it's not about autism, but healthy volunteers, major depressive disorder, and chronic fatigue syndrome. And this was measured in the brain. And we see that healthy volunteers have the most glutathione, major depressive disorder is in the middle, chronic fatigue is less, and chronic, chronic fatigue creates a risk for having an autistic child. And major depressive disorder may turn out to do so too. If your active form of glutathione, GSH, is adequate, then if you are exposed to a toxic insult, you drop down toward a toxic threshold, but you don't cross the line and you recover. If you're fragile with a limited reserve because your glutathione, your active glutathione, the GSH is low or the GSSG is high, when you're exposed to a toxic insult or an infection or stress or sleep deprivation or some combination of all of those, you go way down into the toxic zone, and you can get stuck there and get chronically ill because it's not so easy to come back from that, especially if your diet doesn't give you what you need to catch up on your glutathione, or if you have a genetic vulnerability, or if the stress doesn't let up, doesn't stop. Here is a study of genome-wide expressions in autism spectrum disorder, but also in Rett syndrome and Down syndrome, and these are considered to be developmental disorders. But what they found was that the brain genes, the neurodevelopmental genes, were not what was most prominent. A dysregulated immune response accompanied by an enhanced oxidative stress, abnormal mitochondrial or energy metabolism, seemingly represent the common molecular underpinnings of these, these neurodevelopmental disorders. And that includes Rett syndrome and Down syndrome, which have clear genetic triggers. This suggests, perhaps, that the molecular chaos associated with the genetics may be a worsened or contributed to by the environmentally associated metabolic changes. And I just want to call your attention to a paper that I wrote, Contributions of Environment and Environmentally Vulnerable Physiology to Autism Spectrum Disorders, that you can find on my website, www.marthaherbert.org, under Publications. Here are some factors that may increase autism risk. Air pollution, pesticides, low vitamin D, flame retardants, embedding, or furniture, antimicrobials, and soaps, and heavy metals, and there's much more. Medical risk factors include if the mother has, is obese, if she has high blood pressure or hypertension or diabetes, that can at least double the risk. Maternal infection during pregnancy, a family history of autoimmune immune disease, and a lot of use of antibiotics. And many of these things the, the, uh, are environmental, and the maternal health is a consequence of environmental exposures. Environmental factors that may reduce risk include taking prenatal vitam vitamins before conception and during the, during the first month of pregnancy. Overall, taking these vitamins can reduce risk to 0.62 of normal. But if you have a series of genes that I'm going to talk about more that increase your environmental vulnerability, you have a greater risk, up to a seven-fold increase in risk for autism. Here are some of the genes I just talked about. MTHFR is one of them, COMT, and glutathione sulfotransferase. Glutathione, note, is the, fine, is the end of this interlocking set of pathways. So in any of these mutations, you may have more trouble making glutathione. So anything that comes in, along in the environment to, to deplete your glutathione will put you in a more vulnerable position because you'll have a hard time catching up. And taking prenatal vitamins seems to rescue this pathway for some vulnerable people. Autism is not necessarily caused only prenatally. 
Here's some uh, work anatomically that I did showing that there are bigger brains in autism, and they're bigger because the white matter is bigger. 65% of the brain enlargement comes from the white matter. We also showed that the outer part of the white matter is what's making it bigger. And that part of the white matter develops after birth. You can see out here, this image shows myelination. And you can see that this area that got bigger doesn't get its myelin to make it white until after the ninth month after a child is born. And in this slide, from uh, Joe Piven and Heather Cody uh, Hazlett, you see that the brain can be measured, the head, rather, can be measured with a head circumference, HC. And you start seeing that it gets bigger at nine months after birth, which is the same time as the myelination occurs here. What do we need to learn about the brain and about autism to understand what this postnatal white matter enlargement and brain enlargement is telling us? One of the critical things I want you to understand is that the brain doesn't just have a genetically altered wiring diagram. At every moment of every day, the brain in autism has active tissue pathophysiology, cellular health problems. This was first brought to the public's attention in a pathbreaking study, Vargas et al., 2005, senior author Carlos Pardo, showing neuroglial activation and neuroinflammation in the brain of patients with autism. And these little dots are activated glial cells, astrocytes, and microglial cells. These changes were found at similar intensities in all 11 brains in this initial study, which has now been replicated in various ways, in, in people who had died ages 5 to 44. But in a 3-year-old whom they studied later, there was a much greater intensity of inflammation, suggesting that maybe it gets worse in the beginning. What do brain cells do in inflammation? This is a, pa a, a wonderful diagram I got from a paper, Inflammation and its Discontents, the role of cytokines, that is, immune chemicals, in the pathophysiology of major depression. Remember, I showed you that major depression brains had less glutathione. What's going on in this picture from major depression is really the same as what's going on in the tissue in autism. You have a blood vessel. There's inflammation. It leaks out of the blood vessel. It activates this microglia, microglial cell. And the microglial cell, together with this astrocyte, create a lot of inflammatory cytokines and other chemicals, inflammatory mediators, reactive nitrogen and oxygen species. A lot of quinoline, quinolinate, which is very excitatory. Meanwhile, the astrocyte swells up its feet here that wrap the blood vessel are swollen too, and that squeezes the space of the blood vessel to be smaller. The glutamate in the synapse, the space where one nerve cell talks to another, normally the astrocyte would mop that up, but now the glutamate gets stuck in there, keeping the nerves more irritated for longer periods of time. These excitatory chemicals created by glial cells interfere with these, the normal housekeeping functions of glial cells, which are incredibly important. They take care, like I said, of the, glutathione, the glutamate, and they also take up, uh, clean up the garbage, and they support the neurons metabolically and chemically. Short-term inflammation can solve a local problem, but chronic inflammation that doesn't go away can cause damaging, damage. It is irritating. It promotes excitotoxicity and, and cell damage. So that's what's going on in the brain. And that's not related to information from the outside world that the brain is trying to, is, it has as its job what you're supposed to do. So here's a paper from 2003 by John Rubenstein and, and Michael Merzenich. And it says a similar thing only more schematically. If you have too much excitation, such as from all that glutamate stuck in the synapse, or not enough inhibition, which is from not enough GABA, 
you get more irritability, hypersensitivity, and overload. And this leads to loss of informational complexity and organization. So the brain is not thinking and learning. It's just getting caught up in a bunch of molecular chaos. So you have less signal and more noise, and the brain becomes less organized. So is this a rabbit or is it a duck? Is that the nose of the rabbit, or is this the beak of the duck? Well, really, it's both. And that relates to a paper I wrote in 2005, Is Autism a Brain Disorder or a Disorder that Affects the Brain? Autism was defined by Leo Kanner in 1943 as a psychiatric disorder. He was the head of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University. But 10 of his 11 cases had medical symptoms, eating, tonsils, diarrhea, fever, adenoids, vomiting, poor, poor nutrition, recurrent colds, streptococcus, bronchitis, infection, ear infections, hormone problems, medical problems, a lot of medical problems, chronic medical problems. But in psychiatry in 1943, these would have stayed in the background because they were different from one person to the next. But from a modern systems biology perspective, we see biological vulnerability here in all of these people. Here's a paper that just came out of Harvard. The comorbidity burden of children and young adults with autism spectrum disorders. Comorbidities have to do with illnesses that occur along with a diagnosis. And these encompass disease states that are more common there are more of them in autism, even compared to sick kids, sick children in major medical centers. Epilepsy, schizophrenia, inflammatory bowel disease, other bowel disorders, central nervous system and cranial anomalies, diabetes type 1, muscular dystrophy, and sleep disorders. That's a lot. And that same study, this is the same study, also said this burden of comorbidities goes well beyond those routinely managed in developmental medicine centers, which consist of psychologists and psychiatrists in speech and language, requires broad multidisciplinary management that payers and providers will have to plan for. And I would, I've been looking around with some colleagues, and we find very few places in the United States that have yet developed this kind of multidisciplinary medical as well as psychiatric um, and psychological management. So the time is going to have to come or we're going to have very serious health and medical and financial problems. This is a paper. These are two papers that came out together in 2010 in the uh, journal Pediatrics of the American Academy of Pediatrics that are free online that have to do with gastrointestinal disorders in autism. And this is an unfortunate picture of a child with unmanageable diarrhea, probably due to anaerobic bacteria that are very hard to measure on lab tests. And I show this picture because those of you who have never seen this need to know that it can be this bad. That kind of abnormal intestinal function may well be related to what we're learning much more about, gut bugs, the human microbiome, which serves as the interface between our genes and our history of environmental exposures. And these gut microorganisms can affect our, our psychology, our thinking, our personality, mood, sleep, and eating behavior, and possibly a variety of neuropsychiatric illnesses from affective disorders to autism that may be deeply affected by this. The, the kinds of balances of gut bugs that we have uh, impact also how we handle environmental exposures. So again, this diagram, but again, now I'm going to emphasize that what we're having is a degradation of brain and body function. So you get, as I said, reduced informational complexity and organization, reduced signal-to-noise ratio, and this leads to increased chaos and desperation on the part of the person with these problems and their whole family and other people who have to deal with them. I also want to say that glial cells, which are inflamed in the brain, they're also glial cells in our gastrointestinal system where they serve an immune and signaling and barrier function, just like they do in the brain. And more and more, we're finding out that these glial cells in the gut are implicated 
in brain disease and chronic illness, recently it was found that you could find abnormal chemicals in the gastrointestinal system of people who developed Parkinson's disease a number of years before the Parkinson's disease became apparent, which makes you wonder which came first, the gut problem or the brain problem. Or did they develop together, but the gut problem made it worse? Here's a very important book I, I really want to recommend to you, the, gut, the Other Brain by Doug Fields, a wonderfully written book for the public, explaining glial cells and how this is creating a revolution in medicine and science. And there's a website where you can read about it and order it. There are core functions that have to occur for any living organism to do well. And in autism, we see defects in all of them. You need energy. And in autism, we see mitochondrial dysfunction quite commonly. You need to change some substances into other substances, biotransformation. We have metabolic dysfunction. Metabolism is how you do that, and it doesn't always work right. Transport and circulation, you've got to get one, something from one place to another. Cerebral hypoperfusion and a question of a little bit of increased blood viscosity. Communication inside and outside the cell, we've got immune dysregulation, neurotransmitter, and hormone problems. Structural integrity, low tone, problems with cell membranes and lipids, loss of bone density, osteopenia in, in, in apparently a fair number of people with autism. Protection and defense, immune and autoimmune problems, elimination of waste, impaired intestinal function and detoxification. So we have physiological problems like crazy, and many of these are associated with environmental risks. So what I'm saying is that, and this is another iceberg here, I'm using it differently, whole body systems, symptoms emerge from problems with underlying functions. We see the behaviors, the social and behavior symptoms, but they emerge from how the brain acts differently on account of underlying systemic functional disturbances like the ones in this slide that I just reviewed with you. Autism is complex, and what I mean here is not only are people different from each other, but they have levels that are all involved at the same time. Genes, chemist, environment, chemistry, cells, organs, the wet tissue of the brain, the information processing of the brain, behavior, learning, social interaction, and creativity. And people may be different from each other at many of these levels. But think of it as a zoom lens that you can zoom down and you can zoom up, and these happen all at the same time. And each layer is a facet of the other layers. What, am I, what I am proposing to you, and this is a very important slide, is a different model of autism, where autism as an emergent property created by a system with altered settings, altered parameters, so that autism could be a dynamic, active consequence of challenges to cellular function throughout the body, including the brain. And these cellular changes may be related to environmental insults. Altered cellular response could be at the root of brain and body problems. This could explain the dynamic features, the ups and downs, the improvements, the recoveries, as well as the regressions, the worsenings. The development of seizures during adolescence, things like that. And many cellular problems can be treated. And I wrote this up in a book, in a chapter, in a book called Autism, Oxidative Stress, Inflammation, and Immune Abnormalities. You probably all know the bar, that everybody knows, the bars on your cell phone. When you only have two bars, it's very hard to carry on a conversation because there's so much static. There's poor bandwidth and limited reception. When you've got five bars, you can hear really well. There's lots of bandwidth, good reception, and you don't have to worry about the phone. You don't think about it. Better reception allows better discernment of differences and more spontaneous learning. When you reduce the total load of stressors, you, the goal is to get better health that will give brains more bandwidth. So the body impacting the brain, when the health is better, the brains will do better too. 
So here's a recipe for improvement. If you have poor bandwidth, there's lots of chaos. That is usually, that can be associated with and made worse by poor food with few nutrients and many things that the person is allergic to. Lots of toxins and infectious issues. Lots of stress, pressure, and things coming too much, too fast, too noisy, whatever. If you want to turn that around, if you want to get good bandwidth and rich, creative organization, you need to get, as a, uh, no matter what else, excellent food with high nutrient density, minimal to no allergens. You should minimize toxic and, and infectious exposure and burden. And very important are love, learning, respect, sensitive sensory input, not too much or not too little, and savor each moment with your child. Take it slow and enjoy and luxuriate who they are at this moment. Don't just try and make them somebody else. Now I'm moving from that to a brain slide. This is research we did in my program where we had previously found that the amount of signal generated in the visual cortex, the part of the brain that handles sight, was very much higher in autism, two and a half to nine standard deviations greater from visual evoked potentials in autism than in controls. So what you see here is autism is red, and it's higher in all of, and, and there's, it's particularly significant in this range. And so you've got more power. But on the right side, the red is below. So even though there's more power, there's less coherence, less organization, less coordination between one part of the brain and the other. So I would say we have too much noise, not enough signal. And Shakespeare, the great uh, playwright and poet, said, um, sound and fury signifying nothing. Better bandwidth should improve this. It should, it, it should make the power not be more than necessary and improve the coherence, reduce the noise, and increase the signal. Not broken and not so hardwired. First of all, I want to point out that we've assumed for many years, or people have assumed, and stated as if it were a fact, that autism is a, as a, as a mental retardation syndrome. But that's turning out not to be true. Largely normal or superior intelligence appears to be the case. Michelle Dawson, who has lead, is lead author on this paper and has autism, Isabel Soulier, Gernsbacher, and Laurent Moton, compared IQ scores from the Wechsler scale and the Raven's progressive matrices. Wechsler requires greater communication skills, and we know that people with autism have problems with communications. And in Raven's, you don't need that. The IQ scores in autism in children average 30 points higher and up to 70 points higher with the Ravens. The Wechsler categorized 70% in the retarded range, but the Ravens show just 20% in this range. And um, Goldberger Edelson, a different person, did a review of the literature and found that even though people have said that retardation is a part of autism, there really aren't any that many primary studies that are relevant. People have just been repeating other people and repeating other people, not going back to the source of the data. This is the paper showing behaviors associated with fever, the improvement of fever. To have somebody get better for a few days to a week or two is not consistent with a hardwired broken brain phenomenon. And I have here listed, nobody knows why this is happening. People are proposing these various mechanisms. Here's a very important paper, Narayanan et al., 2010. They gave propranolol, which is a drug which, among other things, reduces stress. And I'm not suggesting you go out and use that as a treatment for autism. This was a ex scientific experiment. Propranolol gets through the blood-brain barrier. They found that within. 20 minutes to an hour, brain connectivity improved with the propranolol. So this now also suggests that, our, that the connectivity, which people have been assuming is a fixed genetic trait, and looking for genes to explain it, 
You change it rapidly with, with drugs that improve stress levels, suggesting that maybe metabolic or nutritional or dietary treatments that could also change metabolism like this could have similar effects or other kinds of treatments as well. Here's a paper, Can Children with Autism Recover, and if so, how? I'm one of the authors. And it's a very interesting paper trying to rethink how we think about autism based upon the phenomenon of kids really, truly losing their diagnoses, which is occurring in at least 10%, apparently, maybe. And in some cases, with certain kinds of treatments, perhaps a lot more. There have been a number of mouse models of syndromes associated with autism, Fragile X, Rett syndrome, and tuberous sclerosis, where the symptoms were reduced, re excuse me, they were reversed with molecular intervention. This has made a big impression on some of my genetics colleagues in terms of what we would think that autism is, and made people want to focus very much on early, very early, or even prenatal or preconceptional intervention. I want to particularly focus on this recent paper from this year, which reversed Rett syndrome in a mouse model without doing anything to the neurons. Rett syndrome is associated with a mutation, MECP2. And for the first good number of years since the mutation was discovered, the studies were all focused on neurons. In the past five years, people started studying astroglial cells. Now, microglia are shown to contribute as well. In this study, they did a bone marrow transplant of wild-type microglia without the mutation into these mice. This increased the lifespan, normalized the bad breathing problems associated with Rett syndrome, increased body weight, and improved locomotor activity, getting rid of some of the stereotypies or strange repetitive movements associated with Rett syndrome, even in mice. This improvement occurred even without direct change or intervention to neurons. They tried to figure out what it was that the, that what activity the wild type microglia were performing that could not be performed by the genetically mutant microglia. And they found that they got rid of the improvements. They lost them when they inhibited microglial phagocytic activity. That's the garbage collecting activity, which is so important to microglia. When they inhibited garbage collecting, all of these problems came back. So this is very interesting, because we have microglial activation in autism, and perhaps the inhibition of the garbage collection could be more central to autism than we ever thought. Genetic and environmental problems may both cause a lot of molecular debris and protein misfolding that would normally, if the, the microglia were healthy, be cleaned up by these microglia. But if the microglia are not working well, perhaps all of this debris is contributing to the reduction of signal and the increase of noise and the inflammation. We don't know that, but it's worth testing. Studying. This was a very important paper, uh, very thought-provoking. They injected lipopolysaccharide into the guts, the, the gut cavities of rats. This increased tumor necrosis, necrosis alpha, which is an inflammatory substance. This increase lasted nine hours in the bloodstream, one week in the liver, and in the brain for 10 months. This means that someone who gets exposed to a trigger of tumor necrosis alpha every now and then, like a dietary allergen or, an, or another kind of allergen, could look like they have a chronic and untreatable brain problem when, in fact, they just have a chronic inflammatory uh, problem that could be potentially reversed. This is an amazing slide. It's not from an autism study, but a Therapeutic nutritional regimen was used to potentize, activate, to, to strengthen glia. And this turned the glia into brain garbage collectors and transporters. Here you see the glia chowing down 
eating, taking inside of themselves garbage, lipofuscin and, and uh, steroid, now that the cell travels to a blood vessel, and then it opens itself up and dumps this garbage into the blood vessel. This implies that you can even reverse fairly advanced brain degeneration through a concerted strengthening of the garbage collection apparatus. And I should also say that lipofuscin, one of the chemicals involved in this, this study, is found, has been identified in the brains of people with autism. And perhaps it's garbage we could take out. So overall, what I'm saying is that, what, that in autism, there's less signal and more noise. That gives you less bandwidth. Whereas by taking care of the body and the whole body system problems, as I explain in much more concrete detail in my book, you can have better signal-to-noise ratio, better bandwidth, better reception, more spontaneous learning, and of course, better health. This is my website, Autism Why and How. I talk about what is autism, how is autism caused. I think of cause as a process, and how can we help? The website reviews multiple viewpoints and their intersections. It's a literature repository and a framework for reflective discourse. Of course, I will be building this on an ongoing basis. These days, I'm very busy with traveling. And as, as this dies down at the end of the fall here, toward December, I'm going to be working on the website more intensively. But it's already up, and you might find it very interesting, autismyandhow.org. And these are my 10 tips that summarize the 10 chapters in my book, The Autism Revolution. Go for the extraordinary. Look for the extraordinary in your child. Don't try to fix them. Help them be everything they can be. Know what you can't control and what you can. You can't change your genes, but you can influence gene expression and make the environment as healthy as possible. Repair and support cells and cycles. Support metabolism and mitochondrial function through nutrient dense, high nutrient density food. Get gut and immune systems on your side. Build better brain health, again, through excellent nutrition. Calm brain chaos through understanding the sensory overload problems that the child can have. Join your child's world and help them develop their interests into skills and widen their interests. Love, rejoice, and make breakthroughs. Lead the revolution. Collect your data. Learn about the science and encourage the science we need to really get people better. And do all this for yourself, your next baby, your family, and your world. And please read my book. This is my book, The Autism Revolution, Systems Biology of, of Autism Told Through Stories of People Who Get Better. Again, my website, Autism, Why and How. This is my research program at the Massachusetts General Hospital at Harvard Medical School. Transcend Research, www.transcendresearch, T-R-A-N-S-C-E-N-D, dot org. And this is a neuroscience and brain imaging research program. And of course, my personal website, marthaherbert.com or dot org, and the book website, www.autismrevolution.org. And I think that Autism Revolution is about autism, but what the strategies that we talk about could really be good for everyone. So thank you very, very much for your attention.